Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the latest episode of The Free Marketeers. My name is Chris, the project manager here at The Free Market Foundation. Thank you all for joining us on our latest episode. I think it's going to be something very uh, um, influential and exciting for you all to get a look at because today I'm joined by Darlene Menzies and Darlene is the CEO of FinFine. Darlene, thanks so much for being with us. Wonderful to be with you. Thanks for the invite. So just uh, for the viewers and listeners, a little bit of background. Um, Darlene, as I mentioned, is the CEO of FinFine. She is the winner of the World Economic Forum's 2017 Top 6 Female Tech Entrepreneurs in Africa. And she has also won a South African Innovation Entrepreneur of the Year Award. One of her FinTech Innovations won the Country Award for Best Business Product at the 2013 World Summit Awards. She was also a Top 5 Finalist for South African ICT Person of the Year alongside the MDs of EOH and Microsoft South Africa, and has been recognized by Zurich-based STARS Group as a future global leader. So Darlene, with that uh, lead in, I'm hoping that you're going to blow our socks off, as it were, today. Um, the main focus of our discussion today is research that your organization released at the end of last year um, around South Africa's SMMEs uh, affected by the lockdown and the pandemic last year, and I'm guessing will be affected throughout the rest of this year. Of course, we wish we could say we're post COVID, but we might not even yeah. be out of the second peak yet. So with that, um, I think over to you, what can you tell us about the research that, that you guys found in the last year? Great, Chris. Thanks so much. I always say, you know, it doesn't help with the intro like that. Sometimes feel like it's all downhill from here, but, uh, Let's see what we can do. Just maybe to give the audience a bit of a, a background to FinFind. Uh, FinFind is a, is a platform that uh, links uh, lenders of small business finance to small businesses. So if you're a small business out there and you're looking for funding and you don't know where to go, you don't, you're saying the bank's maybe not helping you or you're not sure, do you need a grant or, or some equity finance or a loan? Uh, there's about 660 products out there. And so it's quite difficult to know where to start. And so we've developed this platform. We call it like the Tinder of SME funding. It's we've got all the funders and all the funding products in a lot of detail. And uh, the SMEs, uh, um, basically formal, micro, small, medium businesses, um, right up to you know businesses turning over uh, uh, three hundred million, can come in and say, I'm a you know I'm a black woman-owned business in Gauteng and manufacturing. This is what I'm turning over. I'm looking for this type of funding, and then we link you with the funders that can actually help you. So based on our, our um, sort of gathering of data, probably over the last three or four years, uh, we really are in touch with a lot of SMEs. And there was a real requirement to have a look at how uh, um, sort of COVID had impacted uh, this very, very vital sector um, at the start of lockdown last year. So we actually, um, I'll go into the presentation now and give you uh, details about the, the period that we did it, et cetera. But it was done in collaboration with a number of partners, including government and and um private sector, big business uh, organizations working with small businesses. So the presentation, uh, Chris will tell you, will be available afterwards. So if you find me rushing through it, don't worry. It is available in detail, quite a lot to get through. So I'll start now. Thanks, Chris. So we're aware that uh, the, the, the pandemic, you know, whatever sector you, you, you're employed with, it's uh, the lockdown, especially uh, lockdown level five, right at the beginning of last year, well, um, in, at the end of March, had a serious, serious effect on the economy. And um, in having a look at uh, how small business were affected, we decided to run a, a comprehensive survey and uh, we partnered up with the Department of Small Business Development, CEDA and CIFA, who are the two big agencies that work um, under the department, Services CETA, uh, which is the biggest uh, CETA, and then a couple of the big business organizations, Business Leadership South Africa represents over 200 of the, of the um, blue chip companies, uh, listed companies, and, and their response to SMEs, the Banking Association, and, and a number of others. So as I said, the, the survey was comprehensive. Um, it actually had 93 questions. If, so when we, when we asked a small business um, to respond, if they said that they had remained open for the five month period after lockdown, so we did um, from March through to August, they then answered 93 questions. If they had actually closed over that period, and we, by closed, we mean permanently closed, then we, they actually had a, a shorter number of questions to answer because obviously there was information not as relevant in terms of what they see for their business for the future, et cetera. The types of things that the study covered was the profile of the owners, the businesses themselves, the sector, location. We looked at their financial standing, some of the funding um, challenges or, or not that they had gone through, and then just really um, what do they see for the future? 
So we had a sample of 15,000 SMEs that we surveyed. We had a, um, a full, um, uh, about 10% com uh, complete the, the survey, 93 questions. So uh, uh, quite a big ask. So 1,489 is the final sample set and it provided over 250,000 points of data. Those one of the key and most shocking findings was the number of small businesses that had closed. So I'll, I'll go through the actual figures um, and, 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 and the, the employment figures with that but uh, it, was, it was a lot higher than we expected. And a lot of people thought uh, when, we, when these figures were initially um, announced that those must have been all of the sort of the, the very new startup type businesses. And while they did take up um, um, a portion of those, it was quite um, astounding to see how many well-established businesses turning over um, you know, big sums of money, employing between two and five people had actually had to permanently close their doors over that first um, five months. And as Chris said uh, a little while ago in the intro, we've only taken the first five months of lockdown. So really from lockdown level four, three, and uh, lockdown level five, four, and then lockdown level three. And that's when we closed our survey. So we will be doing a follow-up one, but we can, you know, you can only imagine how, um, how the economy has continued to suffer over this time. If we have a look at uh, some of the, I'm just going to give some some uh, broad brushstrokes around some of the reasons for those high failure rates. Um, existing debt was a big one, and I'll go in that go into that in detail. The lack of cash uh, cash reserves, outdated financials, so small business owners not being able to see their uh, their cash flow situation. No access to relief funding was a big issue, and then obviously just the inability, especially in certain sectors, uh, not to be able to operate during those um, during those periods. Is a um, quite a, a, a start, you know, a real stock quote uh, that one of the the black woman business owners gave us to say, "We've actually lost our home, and my children and animals are living with friends and family. We are living with friends, and it's stressful. We're unable to contribute as we have little income." Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think a lot of us in, in in who work in this sector or for this sector can really relate to that. If we look now at the profile of the business owners that made up the sample set of businesses that responded, um, you can see that 50, just over 51% of them had one owner. So uh, that made up more than half of, of, of the, the sample set. And then 27.4 had two owners and the remaining had three or more. I have also provided uh, information here on, um, if you have a look at the green, those are the, the businesses that remained open. And the, and the red is those that, that, that closed over that period. So if we go back to the previous slide, you can see of the total number that answered the survey, 51% had one owner. If you have a look at the total number that remained open, it's 58% had one owner. So in actual fact, businesses that had one owner actually um, uh, had, a, had, a, had a strong survival rate versus some of the others. Um, and, and there's some quite uh, um, interesting deeper data around some of those things. If we look at the, uh, the business owners by gender, uh, just on 30% are solely female. 35% uh, uh, have a male, a male and female owner in their, in their makeup, and then just on 35% are solely male. And um, as it says there, whilst women owners are, are still underrepresented in the small business sector, it was good to see, and this is in a deeper data, you'll see that um, just over 65% of them had at least one woman owner. So they were solely in the solely female owned category and those that, that also were represented in the male and female owners. So, so that was encouraging. Um, if we have a look at uh, previously disadvantaged individuals, as far as owners are concerned, uh, it's noteworthy to note that if you, if you uh, look across that 81.5% of the businesses had, had one or more owner who was previously disadvantaged with 59.9% having at least one black owner. And I have the stats on, on black ownership. The breakdown of black owners, as I said, um, a total of 59.9% uh, of business services had, least, had at least one or more black owners with 31% having one owner um, uh, uh, in the business as, uh, and um, as 100% owner. I know it's quite a lot of uh, to chew through a lot of stats, but I just think it's interesting to be able to, to get these out um, for you to be able to go through them as an audience and um, and be able to start to unpack some of some of the, the things that have really occurred in the sector. If you look at uh, um, uh, owners who are disabled, um, uh, some of the stats there, 7.6 of businesses had um, at least one owner um, who is disabled and um, go on to profile of the businesses now. So um, 
quite a lot of data there, but you can see these are, this is the total respondents. We had uh, uh, rep our, our representative sample was across every industry sector in the country. So you'll see around about the middle, 4.2% uh, of the sample um, it says other, and these are the, um, uh, the actual uh, industry uh, sectors that made up um, the other section. But you can see construction uh, made up 10% uh, uh, of the sample, retail um, and, and wholesale 9.1, uh, RCT, uh, business uh, uh, consulting and the accommodation hotel and tourism. Those were our top five sectors. And later on, I'm gonna take you through the employment stats of those particular um, industries as the top five um, uh, industries in the sample. Uh, this again is, is quite a lot to, to eat through, but um, you can see if we go back of the total sample, construction made up 10% of the businesses in the total sample. If you have a look here under closed businesses of the total close uh, uh, of the total businesses that closed, construction made up 14%. So you can start to to work out which sectors did be, uh, better than others. The sectors hardest hit by the lockdown um, uh, with the most closures was construction, food and beverage, and hospitality. And I think um, uh, hospitality particularly stands to reason because we know a lot of them couldn't start up even after lockdown level three and two. And then the sectors with the highest percentage of businesses that remained open, retail and wholesale, obviously that was uh, even through lockdown level five, they were able to, 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 to stay open. And then ICT and business consulting, really businesses that could um, operate um, from home during, during, from even through lockdown level five, uh, service-based type industries uh, were, 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 uh, did better. So if we have a look now um, at uh, profiles of the businesses by location, it stands to reason that our three biggest business hubs would be where the, the biggest samples would come from. And um, we, we have a look at, uh, uh, interestingly, if you go back for Gauteng, of the total sample of, of businesses that, that were surveyed, 36% of them came from Gauteng. But if you look at the total of those that closed, um, they actually had a higher percentage. Uh, and so you start to see again uh, um, some of those, uh, where some of the problems lay. This is a very interesting um, um, uh, slide always, is the length of time that, um, business, that businesses that remained open have been operating. So again, stand to reason businesses between six and 10 years old uh, took up a great chunk of those that, that remained open because they're obviously well established, they've, they've got uh, cash flow and, and, and things to fall back on and, and, and establish networks, et cetera. And um, interestingly to see though, um, that um, uh, businesses that were four years old were, were, was uh, you know uh, took the took the biggest hit and not by much um, but uh, yeah just a just an interesting stat they normally say if you can survive three years um, that uh, you know you've got a good chance of surviving and big economic shock with uh, with with COVID but uh, you've got to drill down into the stats of those businesses that have been around four years have a look at what industry sector they were in how many owners they had and look at look across the data to get a, re a really good picture of of why that was the case. So I think this is something really important uh, for everyone. It affects everybody. You know, you might, not, you might not own a small business, but you may work in a small business or you have family that work in a small business. So yeah, some really um, shocking statistics. Um, in, in, in the small business sector, 60% uh, job loss over that first, those first five month ends. 76.8% part-time and 53.4% of casual. And of course, those, those two make up largely the gig economy. So a big hit there. And then uh, a 41% reduction in the use of consultants um, over, over that five month period. And so uh, like it says, the impact on the gig economy is significant with a decrease in employment opportunities for casual workers of 53% and part-time workers by, by 76%. So um, that's quite significant. If you look at the, um, of the businesses that responded, um, the makeup of full-time employees of those businesses, uh, you can see that 10% of them were sole props or, or owner-managed businesses with no employees whatsoever. And then um, a lot of people uh, would have thought that that would have been higher. They would have thought that would have made up a, a big portion of the sample, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, sole proprietors. And, and But actually the respondents, you can see the majority are sitting where, you know, um, that big employment there of two to five employees gives you an idea of the the size, uh, the, the, the how mature and established those businesses are and up to employing um, over 50 employees. And again, if we have a look, if we take that 43% um, of the total sample employed two to five people, but of the total sample that closed, it went, it went 
up quite significantly. And so that is where we lost a lot of jobs. And I'm gonna go through the specific job uh, um, um, figures. So in that total of 60% of jobs that were lost, 68% were lost from businesses that permanently closed. So um, those businesses went out of business and all the staff lost their jobs. But 32% of that 60% of business loss actually came from businesses that remained open. So they remained open, but they retrenched staff. And uh, um, again, uh, we're only really gonna see the true impact of job losses um, when, when, when uh, the figures are released in, in the first quarter um, through Stats SA. And we know that the pandemic is ongoing as, as Chris you know, spoke about in the beginning and, and we're gonna, you know, there's, there's more to learn about what's happened since August to now around, uh, around um, the impact of jobs. But if we just take, uh, as I said, we had a sample of 1,489 uh, people that responded. We cleaned up that particular sample to 1,274 when we looked, in, uh, looked at the, the job stats for, for various reasons. We worked with, um, we worked with the uh, uh, senior um, lecturer at, uh, at Vitz Business School, um, who actually did uh, and independently did all of the uh, data analysis. And then it was collated into a report that was published. So if we have a look in Gauteng, um, of those, um, that 60% made, made up um, a, a total number of employees at the start of lockdown and, and, and those number of businesses was 7,728. And we had a total loss of full-time jobs of 4,220 jobs. And that is made up across the provinces. So it's quite a lot to take in just maybe listening if you're not watching or if you're watching and we, we're moving a little bit quickly don't have a, you know, there's still a bit to get through, but if you go back to the presentation, you can really start to have a look at, um, you know, which, which, where the numbers were, where the provinces were that, that, that were hit. Now, um, in the, in the FinFind data set, in our previous report, the, the access to finance report that we released um, in July of 2018, our sample was, was mapped against SARS, against, um, um, against uh, GEM, uh, QLFS, a whole bunch of others, and, and was deemed to be a, a representative sample. This obviously is not, the sample we had then was over 10,000 that we looked at uh, when, when we produced those stats. This is a smaller sample of just on 1,500. But essentially, um, generalizations can be looked at around um, um, you know, the, the, the sample that's there in the sectors and the job losses when you start to look at the bigger, the bigger market and, and what that looks like um, uh, uh, across the whole country. So um, if we go to, this is also quite a, um, quite a, a big slide to take in uh, very quickly, but it's basically taking your top five sectors, construction, retail and wholesale accommodation, et cetera. And then it's having a look at, at start of lockdown level five, um, uh, um, the uh, employment, what the reduction was um, to lockdown level um, uh, four. And this was, sorry, this was the percentage of employment before lockdown started at lockdown level five and four when the reductions happened and then down to the end of level three. So you're talking from, from here, it's the end of March to, to, to here, it's around the end of July, August. And you can see there's been a 15.5% reduction in those first sort of uh, two months. And then another 1.2% reduction um, uh, by the end of those five months. And so uh, obviously manufacturing uh, um, uh, took a big knock and that stands to reason those aren't, that's not an industry that could have worked through that period and um, um, a very uh, a high employment sector. Um, but it, as it says down here, accommodation, hospitality, tourism and travel, this sector here is a sector that has suffered significantly because unlike those other sectors that couldn't start operating during lockdown level four and three. So that, that attrition has continued to happen and many, many of those businesses faced uh, closure. And so again, that's also, an, uh, that's also a sector that uh, provides a lot of uh, jobs for in, in the gig economy. So that's quite concerning. If we look at part-time jobs, uh, as the original slide said, there were 76.8% uh, of uh, part-time jobs lost and 45.6 of them. So just nearly half of those were from the businesses that permanently closed and then over half of those. So businesses that remained open um, uh, made up half of those uh, job losses. Um, this is some of the figures of, of how that split was um, of part-time employees. Sorry, I'm just um, moving this out of the way. Let's go back to that. So part-time employees, again, two to five part-time employees uh, make up a, a large chunk, but a lot of businesses, uh, almost uh, um, over 40% of them had no part-time employees. So you can see where those uh, um, um, uh, part-time jobs take place. 
And again, I won't go into too much detail in this because it's quite a lot to take in. But um, um, if you look at the two to five part-time employees, they made up 29% of the original sample set, but they actually made up 36% of, of businesses that had closed. The stats are similar to uh, the, the, the graph, I mean, the, the table similar to the full-time jobs. You can see how the jobs are split up, which provinces, et cetera. And that's something that uh, people can go through um, if they're wanting to look at more detail. So let's um, go into to business finances. And Chris, I don't know how we're doing uh, uh, for time at the moment, but um, I'll just uh, press on and you can just let me know how, we, how we're doing just now. No, we're so, doing perfectly. Uh, I think uh, keep uh, going at the, the current pace. I think we're doing well. If anyone, by the way, to anyone uh, watching, you know, this presentation, once it's up, if you guys, you know, feel free to pause it as well. You can watch this at your own leisure, as it were. So Darlene, from your side, I'm happy with, with how we're going. Perfect. Thanks so much. So let's look at now the full sample and the average uh, annual income um, prior to lockdown. So you can see that the majority, 50% of the businesses were turning over between 120,000 and 1.2 million a year. So um, uh, you get a gauge of what that sort of monthly income is. But uh, uh, the, the bigger they are, bigger businesses um, that were turning over from 1.2 million and to 12 million upwards. So uh, the actual majority of the, the businesses is not made up by those that are turning over five and 10,000 rand a month, as people might have assumed when they saw the large failure rates. You know, these are businesses that are, you know, 50% of them are turning over, you know, at least uh, 100,000 a month, uh, um, 10,000 a month to 100,000 a month and more. And then, of course, you, you're sitting with the, the, a number of businesses that are turning over more than that. So, um, I think it's just it's just something to really uh, to take in when you realize businesses turning uh, that are employing between two and five people that have been in business um, between uh, some between uh, five and ten years and turning over significant amount of money that 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 actually um, were part of that sample and then you start to see um, uh, uh, we know the numbers that closed and the numbers that that were unemployed. If we have a look at those businesses, uh, the turnover, and we have a look at decrease in revenue. During the first five months of lockdown, there was there was over 76% decrease in revenue. So across all of those businesses, um, only 17% remained the same and then 6.3 increased. And that would probably be a lot uh, if you'd looked in the detail around some of the retail sectors and those that uh, that, that that were those that remained open throughout that period. Um, so uh, it says that 64.8% of SMEs that closed earned less than 30. So you can see a big, a big chunk of those earn less than 30,000 Rand a month. But if you take 30,000 Rand and times that by 12 and start looking at that number, we're not talking about um, people that are turning over, you know, 500 Rand or 100 Rand a month. These are, are businesses that are employing people that are, are formalized, got bank accounts registered with SIPC, et cetera. Um, the average ex um, expenses um, uh, gives you a good indication there of the expenses. And then we've got a graph that shows um, the uh, businesses that permanently closed and uh, uh, a comparison between their income and expenses. And it stands to reason these in the, in the section that are, that are, are, are turning over between um, uh, up to 120,000. Um, and you have a look at uh, income is the, is the red section and, uh, and this is the expense section. You can start to understand, it says many micro businesses have expenses that are higher than income. And there's a high cost involved in starting a business. And, and uh, it's only as it grows, the expenses start to drop and then the business can start to generate profit. So it's these businesses um, that this will be impact the ability of these businesses to survive a big shock like uh, lockdown. And of course, a lot of these are the ones that struggle to secure um, uh, uh, relief from, from funding because they aren't, uh, they're not seen as fundable. They may be, you know, they've taken on big debt and, and so um, uh, some big issues there. Darlene, so is, uh, yep. sorry, I'm going to interrupt your flow here, but on the previous slide, so at the bottom, you mentioned the high cost involved in starting a yep. business. We can get to this in a later on discussion, but I did want to ask, can you give some examples of what high, what could be high costs? Yeah, sure. Of course. I mean, at the end, we actually go through uh, what during COVID where costs increased um, and in terms of what particular um, um, sort of line items or expense items, uh, there, were, there was an increase in cost. But I think the, the, the main take out for this particular slide is that where, where expenses are greater than income, where you've got no profit, um, as the original slide said about businesses that closed, they already had debt. They right. obviously no cash reserves because they've got no profit. 
and, uh, and, and, and they weren't able to access funding. Later on, um, I'm going to go break down expenses and you'll start to see where business had to take on additional expense. Some of that came in where now um, you have people who weren't working from offices, their, their data costs went up from home. And a lot of these smaller businesses are the ones that, that, that haven't got, um, you know, a liquidity to be able to just decide, okay, we're going to buy, you know, routers or whatever the equipment was that was needed, uh, um, uh, per, you know, uh, start eating, uh, eating up a lot more data, et cetera. And then others, uh, obviously, they had uh, a lot of PPE expenses, et cetera. But the, just the general expenses to starting a business, it depends what sector you're in. But of course, you, you've, either got to, you've either got to get machinery or you've got to get uh, furnishes, furnishings. You've got to get you know, basic office equipment, uh, office furniture. Um, you know, you've got to start to learn how to take on staff and, and understand that you know, generally uh, uh, the owners have to start earning salaries and they've been drawing salaries from elsewhere before. So it's those normal startup costs that you know, they ramped up really high in the beginning and you've got to start to get your revenue going to start to, to bring those costs down. And uh, these businesses that were caught right at that, at that place, at that inflection where they hadn't done that yet, then obviously when you, when you get an economic shock like COVID, uh, then they, uh, they had no chance of, of surviving. Um, if we have a look at um, uh, businesses with cash reserves before lockdown, only 35% of the total sample had cash reserves. And... Um, 37% uh, had no debt. So um, by inference, 60, nearly 65%, sorry, I've gone off that side, nearly 65% had no reserves and 62% had debt. That same, so they're sitting no reserves with debt and now they've got to start to, you know, they're expecting certain cash flows to come in. All of a sudden the economy starts to, to shut down. They know they, the invoices don't get paid. They don't get the new work that's due to come in. They haven't got uh, reserves. They're sitting with debt. They're trying to take more funding and you can start to uh, read that picture. If we look at debt before um, a lockdown, I mean, uh, 36%, as we said, did not have debt. And then there's the breakdown of the types of debt that small business had. Uh, soft loans, uh, friends, uh, friends and family and informal lenders, 28%. Uh, the, those are, are, are mainly um, concentrated in those that turn up to between 0 and 120,000 a month. The bigger, um, um, more formal um, uh, debt, bank business overdrafts, um, uh, credit cards, uh, business loans from banks and, 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 and revolving credit. Um, those, um, I, I just want to see, I had, a, I had a stat on what they had made up. Um, I'll come to that now. And then... Um, um, obviously unpaid supply invoices. So you've done the work, your money's sitting in a supply invoice, you haven't been paid that, the other business goes out of business or you just get a, a real lag in payment over that period. And um, um, so yeah, it's just really good to see where the spread of people's debt were in, in the sample of those 1500 businesses. 66% of the businesses that closed had prior debt. So although um, the total sample, 36% had, had um, had no debt. When you just look at businesses that closed, that nearly just more than less than doubled. And then of the open businesses, that's why it's in green. Seventy-three percent of them could not um, service their debt after COVID. We have a look at uh, again some of um, the comparisons of that uh, of that previous slide. Um, you can see how um, uh, uh, businesses with with soft loan were uh, increased in terms of that uh, the, the closed sample versus the original sample, and again, just something that uh, got takes a little bit of of going through to under to to understand the impact. And um, it says that a high percentage of businesses that had taken on debt prior to to lockdown, and uh, as we said, that was um, uh, we got the stat there, it, uh, um, the 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 full number there outside of the thirty six percent that had taken on debt. And this coupled with the fact that only 34% had cash reserves available mean the inability to generate income during lockdown level five put an unbearable financial strain on the business, which is kind of what I informally unpacked just before this, just to paint the picture of where some of these businesses were standing. Um, the ability of um, businesses that remained open to service their debt, as we mentioned here, the green slide there, the green um, uh, icon 73.9 could not service their debt. Uh, those are of the open businesses. So now they're open, they've, they've, they've survived the five months. Um, uh, not many of them have cash reserves. Of course, that's all been utilized over that period. And now 73% um, uh, of them can't service their debt. And of course, they're struggling to get funding. So a difficult, difficult picture. Okay, let's have a look at businesses that were able to negotiate payment holidays um, uh, from uh, people that uh, that uh, either uh, credit agreements that they owed money on or, uh, or, or, or suppliers, et cetera. So um, 
it says there that of those that were able to to um, uh, uh, to get payment holidays, there's now a, there's the breakup of of uh, who they managed to get payment holidays from. And it's interesting to note that only 19.6% of businesses that remained open received payment holidays from banks. So that would have been your revolving credit, your your bank, uh, your your loans from banks, your overdrafts, and your business credit card. Those four um, areas of 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 credit extension um, from the banks of all the people that 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 needed payment holidays, only 19.6% managed to get payment holidays from banks. If we have a look um, at um, this, is quite an important stat. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to get funding, and this is this is obviously financial data, but when we're going to look at funding as the next section, if you're trying to get funding and you don't have up-to-date management accounts, very difficult for, for funders to be able to assist you, which is why whenever wherever you are at any time, you shouldn't have to be scrambling to get management accounts together. You can see that um, of the businesses that closed, 56.4% um, of them had outdated management accounts. So that's these two stats together that either never had them or they were before February, uh, February 2020 because this first month was March 2020. So um, again, uh, significant that over 50% um, uh, of, of the businesses that closed couldn't produce management accounts. So they might have applied for funding, but then they couldn't actually uh, um, produce the, the financial records that were needed. Um, and it says, uh, while nearly 70% of the business do their financial record keeping in-house, it's concerning that only 28% of them had up-to-date management accounts. And that was of that, of, of that total sample. 91.5% of businesses that closed operated without up-to-date financial information and were therefore unable to manage cash flow. So um, some of these stats here are actually uh, that come out of some of the deeper data that are not shown in the slide here, but it's just, it, it's just relevant to see 91.5% of businesses that closed didn't have proper financial information. So let's go a little bit wordy here, but uh, uh, relevant to go through. Some of the key financial ob uh, um, uh, observations, and these are on the businesses that closed. The majority of businesses that closed generated little profit. They had debt, um, had few or no cash reserves, and this left them unable to weather the very negative financial impact of lockdown, as we've already said. Startups and early state business were hardest hit, and businesses earning under 120,000 um, uh, per annum uh, suffered the highest closures, as we've seen, and these businesses were obviously the least likely to qualify for funding. And then other factors that contributed to closures included 89% of the businesses that closed had either never produced management accounts or had very outdated management accounts. And this severely impacted their ability to make good financial decisions. You know, if you can't, I always say, if you drive around in a car without a, without a petrol gauge, you know, you're never quite sure how much petrol you've got and whether you're gonna make the next trip or not. And this is how you operate in a business. If you've got no, no management accounts and you don't ever know kind of, you know, you know what money's in your in your bank account, but you don't know what's coming in, what's going out, what the timing is. Very difficult to run a business that way. Sixty-six percent of closed businesses had already taken on prior debts, so very difficult for them to get extra, uh, additional debt, especially if they weren't already servicing that debt. And then seventy-eight percent of businesses that closed did their own financial uh, record keeping, and only a minority made made use of of an accountant. Not, it's not imperative to make use uh, or to, it's not a problem not to do your own internal financial record keeping. Is It is generally imperative to have an accountant just to give you advice around some of the decisions that you may be making in your business as someone who might not be as financially literate. And um, as it said, startups and early stage businesses really need assistance with record keeping and access to accountants uh, to provide the advice they need if they're going to weather the, and these are some of the learnings that we need to take out and things that need to be done to make sure that we don't get caught like this again. Okay, business finances, new income streams. So 41% of the businesses that remained open were able to pivot. So we just looked at that sample of those that opened and uh, they were able to generate new income streams, uh, get new um, income into the business that they previously uh, hadn't been involved with. Then we asked a question if they would continue to pursue those new lines of, of, um, of income. And 85% uh, of them said they would pursue their original lines plus the new lines. So they obviously had to do a lot more thinking around lateral thinking around uh, um, pivoting. And 4% of them said they wouldn't continue with the new stream. So obviously just some kind of a stopgap that they were doing. And 10% they said they would replace the original income stream with a new income stream. So when you start 
digging down into some of this data. It's terrible when there's limited time. There's so much good data to go through around what sectors were those, what was the pivoting, how did that work? You really start to see some of the innovation that, uh, you know, they say difficulty breeds opportunity. And uh, we saw a lot of that in COVID. Um, we were chatting earlier about what were some of the additional costs that, that, that were incurred during COVID. Well, personal protective equipment, obviously in the industries where, where that was very, very, uh, you know, very needed. Every business that went back into in some kind of office would, would need, um, you know, mask, et cetera. But there were some industries that required a lot more than that and employed a lot more um, casual or, or, or part-time people. Um, data for online work, as we said, is a, is a big issue. I mean, anybody who's worked from home has had to make some kind of adjustment to, you know, uh, um, either uh, uh, ramping up their, 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 you know, their home fiber uh, or, or whatever type of um, LTE or whatever they're using uh, to access the internet. And then again, same for, for mobile connection. Internet connectivity, you know, um, even us in our business, you know, I, 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 I'm involved with, with, with two businesses that employ a number of people. We had to make sure that all our staff working from home, we had to, to get uh, routers or dongles and, and make sure that uh, up, up, up um, data. Uh, and then 24% uh, said they had no additional new costs. And then there's a breakdown from there, which everyone can have a look at. Some of these slides, because there were multiple answers, you don't add up the, uh, um, the percentages, obviously, to equal 100. Some uh, could answer you know, um, um, uh, more than one of them in terms of the additional costs. Savings. Travel and accommodation was a massive saving. I mean, if I just look at myself personally, our business is based in Durban. Most of our big customers, government and, and big business that we work with on Joburg, prior to lockdown, I was flying at least three times a week. Um, and, uh, you know, I basically lived in in in, in um, uh, B&Bs or, or, or hotels or, you know, uh, uh, whatever accommodation and and uh, got to see uh, all kinds of parts of Beshi Gauteng and, 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 and Cape Town and other parts of the country and international travel and been very little travel since then and there's been this incredible uptake of of online meetings and you know uh, very very healthy in many in many respects certainly for family life and and um you know um uh, you know the footprint from an environment per, uh, point of view but uh but yeah, that was one of the big cost savings. And then obviously people with offices, et cetera. So more information that people can go through and can be drilled down into. So 35% had decreased expenses and 21% had increased and then 43% stayed the same. Um, we then asked what was the ability of those businesses that remained open to actually pay their, their next month expenses? So 31% said they couldn't pay their next month expenses. 40% said they could only do it if their customers paid. So essentially you're looking at there, if you add those two together, you're looking at 70% of businesses were not sure about paying the next month's expenses. Some couldn't pay them at all and some could only pay them if someone paid them. And it's quite, uh, it, 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 it's quite desperate when you have a look at that. And, um, and then just on 30% said they could. 70.8% were concerned about paying the following month, as I just said. Um, so what about the businesses uh, uh, that remained open, their ability to pay staff? Uh, well, you can see um, before lockdown is the dark green and the light green is during lockdown. So uh, the business's ability to pay their staff in full um, uh, is 90% before lockdown and 16% uh, and, and, uh, during lockdown. So uh, some of them could pay them in full, some part paid. Um, and then, and then, uh, so the majority you can see during lockdown part paid staff, and then 30% during lockdown could not pay their staff. Um, and it says 10.9% of SMEs had already reduced staff and obviously then made no payments. If we look at the same for the owner's salary, um, before lockdown, 71% were drawing a salary, during lockdown, only 10%. And a large reason for that is owners take salaries last, make sure they paid their staff, their suppliers, got to keep the business going. And so there's some real telling stories in some of this data. Um, businesses' ability to pay their suppliers, um, again, um, just over 25% paid, um, uh, paid all suppliers. Some chose who they were gonna pay uh, and, and some could not pay um, at all, uh, over 35%. Um, ability to pay the rent, so this is obviously uh, uh, quite interesting and there's obviously a lot of, it's a bit subjective as well because not everyone stayed in their premises and so although um, rent was necessary, it wasn't compulsory for them to stay in business at the time, so where they were stretching money, many of them didn't pay, but only 18% paid in full, 19% um, paid a discounted rent, 
but 34% were unable to pay. So some quite interesting stats there. And then what about to pay PAYE? Quite interestingly, quite a large number. If you look at 36% paid their PAYE in full, only 18 paid their rent, and only 26 uh, paid their, their supplies, you can see that uh, the PAYE and even VAT, this is the VAT one, 45% payment. And if you look here, it says the reason majority of them paid more to, to, to SARS than they did to their, to their suppliers and their rent was because they knew that if they're not, um, they're not SARS compliant, they actually, they, if they can't get a tax clearance, they're not going to be able to, to, to get ongoing work. And so real, um, and I think it's something that, um, you know, something that we, that we really need to have a look at over these periods. Going to quickly carry on through cash reserves. Um, businesses that had no cash reserves, 64.8%. And of that, 62.6 uh, stated that cash reserves would, uh, would last between one and three months. Those are businesses that remained open. The number of months that, that owners of businesses that remained open anticipated, so this isn't how long it happened, how, how, much, how long it lasted, it's how much they anticipated it lasted. So when they were asked, how long did you anticipate your cash reserves, those that had cash reserves, remember only 34% had cash reserves, how long did they think it would last? Or well, 15% said they think it would last more than six months. If we look at the next slide, it, uh, it, only 8.2 uh, 8 actually lasted that long. And so um, you can start to see what people anticipate. They didn't anticipate how long COVID would last, how severe it would be, how few people maybe would get payments in, you know, where the expenses would increase, et cetera. So, so very, very interesting. Um, most, 64.2 uh, of businesses had um, only had cash reserves that would last one to three months, as the previous slide said. And as lockdown pro progressed, the cash uh, reserves became depleted. This meant that these businesses would not have had the ca available cash to help them survive and grow during this top, uh, through this top economic, I mean, this top econo economic time. We've been through that. Funding, very quickly. We're not far from the end. Businesses that requested funding during COVID, of all of the businesses that we surveyed, um, just more than half did not request and just under half did request, quite interestingly. Of those that did request of the total, whether they were open or closed, there was an, there was over a 90% rejection rate. It was just on 91%. So um, only 10% or just under 10% of businesses that applied for funding actually received funding. If you look here now between closed and open businesses, comparison of businesses that remained open and those that closed that requested funding. So of the 100% of businesses that closed, 42% requested funding, and of the 100% of business that remained open, 47 requested funding. What is a very, very um, telling uh, statistic is that of, um, it says here that the, uh, the this stat uh, I know relates to, to closed businesses, 99% of businesses that closed, that 99.9% uh, .9 of businesses that applied for funding that closed did not get their, their funding. Only 0.1% actually were funded and only point, obviously 0.1% closed that were funded. But if we look at where they got their funding or where they um, applied for their funding, not where they got their funding, um, uh, over 45% applied to government, then to banks, uh, then some formal lending and informal lending. And uh, quite interesting to see the mix. And as we said, there of those that applied, it was just on a 91% rejection rate. Reasons given by government for rejection, well, sadly, 50% of the, of the people that applied, whether closed or not closed, uh, later closed, did not even receive a reply. And this is something uh, um, uh, that needs to be addressed. 14% uh, of the business was not generating enough revenue to qualify. Um, 12 were notified of rejection, but not given a reason. So if you add that 12.8 and the 51.5, you know, makes up a big chunk of people that didn't even know why they didn't, re uh, didn't receive funding which doesn't help knowing in future what to change to make sure you do get funding. So this is something that, that government needs to be looking at. Um, and one of the biggest frustrations that business owners had to deal with was a culture of no response. If we look at banks, um, sadly, one of the primary reasons that banks are still rejecting um, um, business funding applications is because the owner has a bad consumer credit score. And this is a big thing that needs to be addressed because there's not good business credit data in the country, if you as a business owner go to apply for, for um, a loan for your business, the, the, the bank, the first thing they do is they go to the credit bureau and they look at you as a business owner, what is your credit score? And if you've got a bad credit score, because obviously you've been doing all kinds of things to try and get the business to where it is, then you actually get rejected for, 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 business, uh, for business credit. And it's something that a number of us are taking up um, 
with the National Credit Regulator Banking Association and the banks to say, we have to be able to look at the business, have a look at how they've been managing their, 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 their supplier repayments, how they're managing their current uh, credit repayments, um, look at the, 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 the behavior of the business. You can take into account the, the owner's behavior, but it, it shouldn't be weighted as high. 32% received a, a, a no response, or the res and then 23 received a response, and but no reason given. So again, over 50%. This just underlies what I've just said about banks needing to look at new models, where it's not a one size fits all. The way they look at small business and 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 um, not only the uh, the consumer credit record, but the other thing a bank looks at immediately goes to the personal bank statements of the business owner and has a look: have they received a a salary of the same amount? every month for the last three months. Well, obviously through COVID, that wouldn't have happened. Prior to COVID, obviously some businesses don't land up paying themselves, business owners don't pay themselves like that. Um, they're paying their staff and, their, and their, their suppliers first. So now all of a sudden comes to COVID, bank calls for bank uh, personal bank statements. They have a look, they say, well, there's no uh, security here because the business owner is, uh, is, is employed in the business, is not employing, is uh, doing a salary. So they're looking at a small business like a big business. There's a lot to go on here, which don't have time to. Quickly moving on, reasons why um, um, uh, owner's perception of why they were rejected. This is quite interesting to go through. I won't spend too much time here. Um, business operations. 60% of, of SMEs were not able to operate during lockdown. We're aware of that. And I've, I've unpacked some of this around who could operate in normal hours and reduced hours. Going to have to look at some of that data yourself so we can move on. And where, um, where, um, where the businesses that remained open worked from during lockdown. So did they work from home? From their work premises, etc. So you can see that um, before lockdown, only 3.8% of them. Um, uh, let's take uh, that. Uh, actually, a correction I must make on that slide. Um, uh, did not uh, did not basically were working from virtual environment. But if we have a look here, uh, lockdown level four, 21% uh, worked uh, worked from home or work premises. And if you look at um, uh, that was 3.8% uh, uh, before lockdown had worked from home. So uh, look, it's a lot of data to unpack, but um, the, the, the sum total of it is, is that we all know the, the, the logic that in, in those first couple of months, everyone couldn't work from, uh, from premises except retail. But then you start to see um, up to lockdown level three and where things are now, far more people working from home, far more people working from a hybrid of office and home. That's one of the big things that have changed, that they've moved away from office only to office and home. If we look at reasons business elected to work from home, worried about virus transmission is an obvious one, um, provide staff with uh, better quality of life as there's no travel time, a lot of saving on travel, there's a whole lot of, of, of comorbidities of staff, et cetera, and um, there's some that always work from home. And then staff that could not uh, work from home, why could they not, uh, or what percentage could not work from home? So, you know, we had some of our interns that uh, we really struggled to, to organize in the particular living environment they were to be able to, to get them online and do what they needed. And I think that was uh, represented in a lot more people across the country. So 38% of um, the total businesses that remained open of their staff could not work from home. Reasons why businesses that remained open had staff that were unable to work from home. So again, it's the type of work they did. So cleaners, people that, that do tea and, and that sort of thing. Um, or if you were a, a sewer in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a plant, whatever the case may be, you couldn't take that job home. So that made up a big part of that. Um, uh, and then you didn't have the equipment to do it, unstable internet and other reasons. Profile of customers. Um, profile of customers are the businesses that remained open. This is very interesting. Of those that remained open, um, who were their customers? Well, 69% uh, um, of them had customers who were individuals or consumers or small businesses made up the majority. Again, this won't equal 100 because you can have both individuals and businesses and big businesses. But it was quite interesting to see how little of the business came from, from government and, 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 and a, a slightly greater percentage from big business. And so um, a lot of, of, the, of, the, of the access to market opportunity for this sector of the market is coming from other small businesses and medium businesses and from individuals and consumers. How the customers of businesses that remained open responded. So of course, because a lot of those were small, were either individuals or were small business owners themselves, they canceled orders, they postponed orders, they stopped placing work orders, 
or they did not pay their invoices on time. So you can imagine how that affected those small businesses who had small businesses as a large part of their client base or had individuals. So um, the economic uh, fallout of lockdown was significant with a huge knock-on effect. And this is evident with a high percentage of cancelled orders or, or work of 42% postponed, as I said, and reduction. So um, yeah, I think it's very, very telling this slide. And then lastly, doing business online. Well, the, major the big story is that the majority or a lot of small businesses were not ready to do business online. So if we have a look at those, these are business, we only ask questions to the businesses that remained open about um, their use of technology, et cetera. It stands to reason that businesses that had closed, we asked a smaller sample set of questions, probably about only 40% of the questions, because I mean, they were going through enough pains as it were, and the things we were trying to get from them was what industry sector, how many people they employed, what were they turning over? So we could start to get line of sight of how to help those types of businesses, but we didn't take them through the full um, 93 questions. But use of technology prior to lockdown by businesses that remained open. Only 56% had a website, and while 61% had a Facebook presence, whether that was for themselves or their business, nearly 60% 60, 60 had never done paid digital marketing. So it's quite, uh, quite telling. 22% of the businesses that remained open had never ever used social media. Um, if we have a look at the percentage of businesses that remained open that engage in digital, digital marketing, again, not a lot. Only 16% are using Google AdWords. So if you're thinking they need to have online presence, they need to be making their presence known from a search engine optimization point of view, from an advertising point of view, a lot of this was just foreign to, to, to many of the businesses. Comparison of the use of online meetings before and during lockdown. So again, very interesting. Um, so if we have a look here, People that had never had a business meeting before lockdown, 57% after lockdown, that had reduced. So uh, uh, quite interesting, a few times a week. Now, just on 10 per or nine and a half, 10% of them um, had never had, uh, before lockdown, had, had, a, had, a, had a meeting, sorry, a few times a week. And that grew dramatically to, you know, more than 20, 25% to having business, um, um, online meetings more than a few times a week. So very interesting that. Uh, this is an interesting stat around the, the platforms and probably some of some of these platforms would like to know some of these stats, but of the, the size base we had for a sample, which was a decent size, you can see who was using what platform. And then um, generally SMEs were all prepared for the online business world. Many small business owners in South Africa weren't prepared. 58% had never run an online meeting, 59% had never advertised their business online. And 45% cited the high, high cost of data as an additional expense and obviously something that constrained them uh, from doing this. And uh, yeah, some really, really interesting stats here. And then uh, just lastly, we go here into the challenges. The challenges for business owners, very telling and, and something that really need to be looked at. Stress and anxiety are, com are, are still the common challenges for business owners, but more so when you look at COVID. So if you have a look at your top issues there, Stress and anxiety of, of owning a business in these uncertain times. Stress and anxiety of not being able to cover expenses during a pandemic. Stress and anxiety about how long it will last. Stress and anxiety of not receiving salary for some months. Concern that I and my family. So, so much, um, if you look at the psyche of the business owner, so much stress uh, uh, imposed. And running a business, at a, a, a small business at, at the best of times is, is, is stressful, magnified over these periods. And as, as I said, top six, Findings. And there were actually, um, uh, if you go to the report itself, which we'll tell you about now at the end, there's about 20 different reasons or different uh, challenges, should I say, that, that small business site, these are the top ones. And then what are the challenges for businesses? So not the business owner themselves individually, but the business. Access to funding remains the top one. I cannot get access to funding, of course, unable to pay salaries, struggling to find new clients, a whole bunch of reasons there. And, and these are all the things that government and big business working with enterprise development programs, et cetera, need to look at. And then what about the owner's perception of the future? Well, 76.7 um, uh, of them believe um, uh, that that remained open, sorry, are optimistic about the future, believe that they will survive 2020. 21% are uncertain whether their business will still be open in a year's time, which is in this August coming, and 2% don't believe they'll still be in business. As you know, entrepreneurs are probably eternal optimists, so quite interesting, the figures. How businesses that remain open perceive their ability to create jobs in the future. So 32% said they'd be increasing their staff this year. 56% said they would remain the same. 11% said they would have to reduce staff. 
11% was made up in the 32% that said they would increase staff. So at least there is a positive story there, but we know there are hundreds and thousands of jobs that have been lost. So it's a lot to make up. Where the businesses that remained open will operate from, again, I won't go to, we've, we've been very long uh, on, on this presentation, but it's something that's good to go back and look at. We'll go back to working from our offices. Only 46% say they'll go back to working from their offices. 19% uh, we will not return to physical premises. We will work uh, home or virtually. So there's a big loss there and uh, some that will do a hybrid. So again, um, very noteworthy in terms of commercial property industry and how they start to see how things are gonna go forward for them. Changes that businesses will make in the future. They're gonna develop new income streams, get a cost cutting mindset, um, start online marketing. So these are some quite interesting ones to go through. A big focus on new income streams and online business. And then, um, just lastly, what are business owners? Lastly, lastly, it sounds like, but just these closing slides. What assistance are business owners saying they need? Well, 64% are saying we need funding to grow our business. 51 saying they need funding to survive lockdown. So the top two again, funding. Then we need assistance with digital marketing, marketing and sales strategies. So that's all around going online. How do we market? This is all new to us. We need help to change business models. How do we pivot our current income streams are not bringing in the money that we need. And that's the final slide of showing those are the five top areas that uh, need assistance. Access to grow the business, access to survive lockdown, access to funding to survive lockdown, digital marketing, marketing and sales, and then pivoting. And um, yeah, so I think these are very, very telling slides. And that, uh, Chris, is the end of the report. So I don't know if, uh, if you're still there hanging on, but uh, you know, it's a lot of data, but the data is so interesting. It's hard to know what to leave out. There is a lot that I've left out. So if you go to the report, it's on the FinFound website. I think you're also going to um, speak about putting that, uh, how they can access that directly from your website. And we're not only going to put the present this presentation, but also the summary uh, report and the detailed report, which gives a lot more detail on some of this information. So yeah, thank you for your time. So a lot of sobering, I think, statistics in there, uh, but started off, I suppose, with, yeah, what has happened. But I know, as you, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned about entrepreneurs being the eternal optimist kind of thing and what, what maybe we as, as the FMF can take from it and what the viewers and listeners can take, whether they're in small business or, you know, we have people from all sorts of areas that, that watch our podcast and our presentation. So if I could, I mean, if I could give you a magic wand to say over the next 12 months, what, what three, three to five things could you wave that wand at and fix and make it easier for small businesses? Are there any regulations, examples of regulations that jump out to you? I mean, from the free market perspective, I want to say freeze taxes for, <laughs> for 12 months, but sure. that's not necessarily realistic. So is there anything that, sure. that jumps out to you in that sort of looking forward framework? Look, I think um, the reality is that there is a responsibility on government to have a look at where small business is at the moment. I mean, when you look at access to funding, there is money out there. I mean, we right. know, you know, there's huge amounts of money that's been made available, but the way that had, it's been positioned has not been accessible to small businesses. And the qualifying criteria is what is constraining businesses accessing that funding. So, I mean, definitely there shouldn't be one um, um, government agency or private fund, uh, private sector funder that should be looking at a tax tax compliance certificate at the moment mm -hmm. from a small business to say whether they're going to qualify or not for funding, because I mean there's just a reality around the survival mode that people are in at the moment. They are just, uh, you know, the good taxpayers that just have 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 fallen behind over this period and have to make up a lot of a reason why they're applying for funding is to try and and actually get themselves back into into a decent position. The way that 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 lenders are looking at small business owners, that they, they, it's a for years they've had to change the way they actually um, uh, 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 score a business and assess a business. COVID now has to raise that uh, uh, in 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 sort of in big writing across banking association, um, all of the banks to say that you cannot now look at old ways. You know, look at a personal business, uh, look at the, the at the owner's credit record to decide if you're going to give it to the business. We need access to new data to be able to see that. You know, can that does has that business been paying its suppliers? You know, has it been paying its 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 um um its expenses, etc.? Is it mm -hmm. able to 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 repay debt? So I think. Firstly, we need, uh, I would say, I mean, do we need to be as radical as say, let's go back to a national small business amnesty. 
you know, where we actually, uh, we, we give the businesses over this period amnesty from tax that they owe. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't have to be all small businesses, but those that are viable, you see not every business is viable. You know, many of them have bad business models and wouldn't have been able to survive anyway. But there's enough data and there's enough access to be able to see there's certain um, um, uh, 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 portions of, of the business sector that if we're given a little bit of relief um, would actually be able to, but at the moment they, you know, they they they're drowning. So I do think there there, there is um, there is requirement there. Um, there's a lot more assistance needed, very pragmatic assistance, um, helping small businesses to 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 get online presence, to be able to to pivot to 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 online sales strategies, to marketing, um, and and you know I speak to many many uh, different size um, uh, uh, owners of different size businesses, and it's amazing. Uh, to find, you know, how few of them are taking full advantage and where they don't know where to find those skills, who can help them, they don't have the money and that sort of thing. So I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work needed there. But um, uh, certainly, um, uh, I think there's uh, around, uh, around tax relief, um, around much, much easier access to funding. Uh, the, the barrier to entry has to be lowered. Uh, the government has to take has to take like some of the other countries have taken. They have to take a knock where you know it's not only um, you know, where, where they where they where they not only putting up collateral, but they're actually getting involved uh, uh, and 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 sharing some of some of the some of uh, of the weight of the private sector um, uh, in terms of 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 being able to get. We have to get funding relief to small businesses that are still viable that can still make it. That, that have started to retrench that are that are right on the border and there's a lot of those we can't afford more businesses to to lose so funding is huge um, uh, 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 legislation or, or changes around um, some kind of amnesty or at least um, um, some tax some tax relief in in a in a in a, in a, in a much better way that, that 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 has been done so far I know government's got a lot more uh, of their kind of ducks in a row around how they how they they're working with a lot of of, of um, you know, especially on the, uh, the UIF side, and that can be brought through. Um, and then, of course, you know, we need to get um, uh, workers in the gig economy going again. New type of of of, of jobs that, uh, that that need to be found. Innovative, uh, catalytic projects that that government has to put big money behind. So, yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of work to do. I think we could also talk about, I mean, you, you get the, the free marketeers talking about some of the government's quote-unquote quote unquote priorities in terms of some of the SOEs that they decide to to bail out all the time that we could talk about. Maybe some of that funding could be reallocated or reprioritized or something like that. I mean, it's not an ideal situation, but it's, you know, it's, I, as you say, one has to be pragmatic at some point and realize, you know, government only has so much to spend, so maybe they should relook at some of their um, their priorities. A final question I had for you was just around, and it's difficult, of course, to say because each person and each business situation is is different. But if you could give advice to small business owners um, of the varying sizes of in different industries, what should they focus on? Sort of prioritizing in terms of their operations, streamlining that kind of thing for the next few months. Yeah, look, I think the two major focuses have to be in 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 curtailing expenses, and and sometimes it's hard as a business owner. You you know, tough calls have to be made. I'm not just talking about staff. I'm talking about you know decisions that are going to make life hard for a while, like anything. But innovation is huge. Pivoting has to happen. This word has has been spoken about a lot. But essentially, you know, you can't flog a dead horse. If you've got an income stream, um, uh, you know, the, the whole you know the things have changed. Not only globally, locally. The way that that, that that business is being done, you've got to take a serious look at your business. You know, you've got to you've got to cut things that aren't working, um, and 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 you 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 sometimes you've got to be a bit ruthless there, and you've got to have a look at how can you take what you have, what you know, what your current skills, your current expense base, and how can you 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 you, mono, you monopolize that and optimize that to create a different type of revenue. And uh, you know, I, I always use that example about uh, you know in the gold rush. You know, everyone thinks that the people that made the most money were those that, um, you know, were panning the gold or, 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 or were getting the gold. But actually, you think of the people that made the pans. Everyone needed a pan. And so sometimes there's a lateral take on your current industry, on, on what you need. And, you know, difficulty does breed opportunity. And what's the stone in your shoe at the moment that if you could solve, you could solve for a big market. And, uh, you know, We've seen uh, some some transactions from Silicon Valley and venture capital over, over this COVID time. Um, 
where you know, uh, looking at, at and innovations that are coming out of this, out of these challenging times that are being taken up, and and we can speak to some of those. So, you know, there is new money out there, and so you know, the main focus is tighten up as much as you can, keep the ship as lean as possible, jettison those big cars and the things, and and be real about where you're at, and have a look at new income streams because basically you're in survivor mode. You've got to, you know, it's a bit like you're out there, you're in the desert. You've got to eat as little as possible, drink as little as possible, get to the oasis that you need. Get to where you're going to. You've just got to get there. It doesn't help if you if you if you die along the way, you know. And so, yeah, my encouragement is, you know, stick around people that are encouraged and that and that are doing those sorts of things, you know. And make sure that you are networking well and take advantage of, you know, so many of the events now are for free and they're available online. So we don't have the big expense of travel and events and that. And equip yourself and and and, and pivot and and uh, hold on um, because, um, you know. Entrepreneurs are the champions of South Africa. We 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 employ some of the, you know some of the bigger we a big contributor to GDP. We 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 we're one of the biggest employer base of all the business sectors. We have to survive if the country's going to survive. I can't think of a better note on which to end. It's easy to get weighed down by what happened in the last year, but I think you you point to it's sort of a way a way forward and a way out for for a lot of people. So on that note, Darlene, I have to thank you for for your time today. I think it's been incredibly useful. Um, I hope that people Pleasure. watch your presentation a few times and process it, chew it over and think about what they can do with it. So, so thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for the time. Much appreciated. Uh, viewers and listeners, just another reminder to all of you, um, if you found value in this episode and indeed in all the other work that we do at the FMF, please remember to like the video, please share it on your different social media platforms and of course, subscribe to the FMF's YouTube channel. We'll have a lot more content coming for you. In the next while, I will link to all of the different resources from FinFind in the description of the video, and you can find those links on the Free Market Foundation website as well at uh, www.freemarketfoundation.com. For now, we will say uh, take care out there, stay safe, and we'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.